This is Matt Lewis. I play Ron on Cobra Kai, and I'm with Chris Gordon on Hellblazer Biz. Everyone, I have the pleasure and the honor of the company of Matt Lewis today, who among many roles is Ron on Cobra Kai. So welcome, Matt. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to finally meet you. Uh, as I say, I've been getting into the show myself recently, and it all started with Susan, who then pointed me to your direction and, and, and flooded the gates open with all the Facebook groups that I've been, I've been invited to join, which is fantastic. Oh, yeah. The fandom is amazing. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I've never uh, been a part of anything like this. That uh, the, the, the fan base is so supportive and into the show. It's really cool. It is. It is absolutely fantastic. And uh, like I said, I've already said to you now, you're rocking your Miyagi-Do t-shirt. You've got your Cobra Kai um, flyer behind you on the wall. It's uh, <laughs> very, very much. Uh, it's, it's just a brilliant show. As I say, I've managed to binge watch because uh, I, I, it was on my list for ages. Cobra. I mean, we'll talk sure. about other things, obviously, in a minute, but just while we're on the subject. Um, I've because of doing what I do on my show, I've got a massive backlog of stuff to watch, which I'm trying to get through. And so Cobra Kai has been there. And then I thought, right, okay, let's, let's get this watch now. Um, Cause I thought I was introduced to Susan and I've just not mm-hmm. stopped. It's one of those series where you binge watch, you just can't stop. <laughs> it's just yeah. absolutely fantastic. And yeah. the, the final, I'm not going to ruin it for people who may not have seen it, but I think everyone has who's watching this now. The last episode of that season two, that scene in the school, yeah, mind yeah. blowing. It was just, I was I literally, we were both of me and my wife were on the edge of our seats, just like, <gasps> just waiting for something to happen. Yeah. And are you, with, with that final fight, are you aware of the, there's like a really famous uh, one off shot in that fight? Did you catch that when you saw it? Oh, <laughs> so if no. you go back and rewatch it, yeah. If you go back and rewatch the, you know, the, the, the big thing at the end of uh, uh, mm-hmm. episode 10, season two, there's a shot and it's a single take and it starts when um, uh, Tori and, oh shoot, what's her name? Uh, uh, Sam, Sam, Sam yeah. uh, start, start fighting, mm-hmm. right? And then it's a single take that moves all the way down the hallway and it lasts almost a minute, I think. And it ends when Stingray comes out of the office and, oh, and yeah. jumps in. But the the uh, I've heard in other interviews, the big three have talked about that shot a lot. Mm-hmm. And they said that, uh, and it's fascinating when, when you go back and rewatch it, knowing all this stuff. They said that um, they had stunt people that were swapping in and out uh, for actors. And I think there was even a time where uh, the stunt woman that covers for Sam also covers for Tori. So she had to jump out of the shot, change costumes, jump back in as another character. And meanwhile, the actors are swapping in and out of, in and out of that shot too. It's crazy. Wow. Um, yeah, so if you go back and check that out, it's really cool knowing that. that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, that, yeah, considering how fast that scene was, and that, how that went, yeah, to do yeah. that, that with, oh, that, that just blows my mind. Just shows some very talented people there, both in in, in the actual actors, the stunt people, and the uh, the cinematographer and the, and the cameramen to actually manage yeah, to capture sure. everything. Everyone come together, uh, and yeah. I think that's what makes Cobra Kai really good. Anyway, so uh, it's just the fact that it, it's, it everything gels together so well. They've brought perfect people in for every part of the cast, like yourself and Susan. Obviously, you, you know you've got uh, Ralph and uh, William back as well in the main roles, and and. Um, mm-hmm. Martin and stuff as well, but everybody, all you guys, all gel together. I mean, your role as well as Ron is brilliant because I see that coming in, and you know, you're on the you're on the board, and and you're the you're the sense of reason. <laughs> well, I say reason because <laughs> to be honest, in in season one, I've got to admit, I thought that Danny, the character, was a complete jerk, and I was <laughs> which is what it's supposed to be, I think, because you see the whole role sure. of her is a comp. That's what that was what's so exciting because it wasn't just. Sorry, I'm, I'm rambling now. Sorry, Matt. I was just yeah. going to say, yeah. No, you're yeah, right. so, yeah, this is obviously where you see, because you see that whole season one of, you know, you, you think it's a sequel, it's a show built on it 35 years later, but what though, for the clever thing is, is, is how they've reversed the roles of the two characters. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and you really do. I mean, even at the end of season two, to be fair, I am still team Johnny. <laughs> <'Cause I've, you laughs> know, <laughs> yeah, we've made some bad, you know, but you, you do, you start rooting for it because you can see 
the background you can see what what he's trying to do yeah where, where he's come from and then obviously danny's made it big and famous he's dead he's really rich and and, and, and it's just it's amazing having that entire like mirror flip isn't it a 180 mm -hmm. flip on the lifestyles it, it's fantastic and I think that's yeah i think that's, that's right one now. of my favorite there's one of my favorite things about the show is that um you know it is a continuation of the the karate kid saga but it's also its own thing and it's this uh just this perfect combination of drama and comedy but it also just has 100 percent of the heart that the karate kid movies have always had um and so it's just sort of a, a successful uh, uh rehashing of um you know some great movies but it's um it, in no way shape or form does it ever feel like you know they've just dragged this thing back out to to make some money which is you know quite yeah. often what happens there's a there's a thing in the business called uh I mean, for lack of a better term, it's called it's just name recognition, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, which is one of the main reasons why so many things get rebooted. And it happens on uh, Broadway a lot, too. Uh, they'll say, uh, well, yeah, we can take this famous, iconic movie, and just make it a musical, and, and you know, yeah. we can put it on Broadway. It doesn't necessarily even have to be good. Mm -hmm. It's still going to make a certain amount of money just because uh, people will go, oh, well, I love the Footloose movie. I might go see the musical, you know, yeah. um, just because it's got that instant name recognition. But they, mm -hmm. this Cobra Kai is not guilty of that in any way, shape, or form. Um, and I think it's, I would be a super fan of the show, even if I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, yeah. I can I can guarantee that. And I remember um, uh, auditioning for, I think, at least three other roles before um, I booked Ron. Mm -hmm. and when uh i'm i'm based in atlanta so in the southeast uh, now everyone's self-taping auditions but in the southeast for the longest time all of our almost all of our auditions were, were self-tapes whereas if you go to an audition in la or new york you usually have an appointment and you go in person yeah um, but here since they're casting out of a whole region it's just easier to tape and so they never when we get an audition they never send us the whole script but we'll get a couple of pages for just our little scene. Mm -hmm. And so everything that I got to read, I mean, I remember getting that first audition for Cobra Kai and I was like, <laughs> pardon my French, but like, holy shit, like what mm -hmm. is this? This is what? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just so excited because I was a, I grew up a huge Karate Kid fan. And everything that I got to read was, like I said before, just this perfect balance of, of comedy, but it still was, you know, honoring the, the, the original material and uh and so i just kept thinking i mean they shoot stranger things here they shoot avengers movies here they shoot the walking dead here and i just kept thinking like i don't care like i want cobra kai like this is what <laughs> yeah shouting this into the universe this is what i want not that i wouldn't love to be in an avengers movies too but you know <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah it just i've it's been just such a such a blast and uh such a privilege to be able to be um you know part of that world no, fantastic! It's great, and and you're right. I think it's you know, uh, like you say, I was, I know, I know, I knew. Sorry, I knew you were a fan of uh, Karate Kid anyway, and um, but it's such a legacy. The whole it's like there's certain things in certain films which have lasted the the, the tales of time. Obviously, you've got Jaws, you've got Star Wars, you've got Indiana, and you've got the Karate Kid, and you know, I mean, even before Cobra Kai was the round we were painting fences in my back garden and things like that and you know and it was yeah. and it was always like you know i was doing this and taking the mic and doing the you know waxing the car i was teaching my son to do the wax on and wax off when we're, when we're yeah, exactly and he's like what are you doing you know, dad <laughs> yeah and if you're working on something in the yard you know you always want to try and hit the nail hit the nail in with one tap you know yeah. <laughs> always yeah, oh, yeah. For sure. definitely definitely i mean you know i think i wouldn't 1985 wasn't it or was it 83 so I was about eight or ten when it came out so yeah totally influenced my life <laughs> oh, <me too. laughs> yeah yeah it came out in 84 and I remember because um my dad had gotten a new job he was a professor mm -hmm. and he had just finished his, just finished his PhD uh in theater and was and he had gotten his first teaching job and so that's at the beginning of that summer um our family moved for the first time to a different state right and I was a new kid and right in, in our vicinity of the neighborhood, 
um, so I would have been, I was going into fourth grade. Mm-hmm. And so I could cruise around on my bike a little bit, but you know, not all over town. And there weren't a lot of kids in, in our area that I mm-hmm. saw. And so that summer, uh, we moved at the beginning of the summer and I didn't make any friends until school started at the end of the summer. So that summer was like pretty, pretty long and lonely. Um, but Karate Kid came out and, uh, I went and saw it a couple of times. And of course this is, you know, way before videotapes and, you know, all that stuff. Um, but I mean, you know, watching Daniel navigate being a new kid while I was being a new kid at the same time, um, just really helped me get through that summer. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had the, um, the soundtrack on vinyl and I dubbed it onto a cassette tape. And so I just put that thing in my Walkman and just rode my bike around the neighborhood for the whole summer and wore that thing out. And I actually, I still have that album on vinyl and actually got, um, Ralph to sign it for me. Oh, uh, the last time I was working, which was really cool. Yeah, yeah, that, that's impressive. That, that's uh, that's a that's a fantastic little tale. <laughs> yeah, no, it was kept great. it with you all your life, and then yeah, finally get him to sign. No, that's really good. That's... <laughs> well, yeah, and it, you know, to your point where you're talking about uh, Star Wars, I mean, it, it, you know, in in my line of work, uh, especially with the roles that I've been booking now, mm-hmm. um, you know, I you know, I'm, I'm often in for like a few episodes as sort of a a supporting character but because of that like you know I, I meet famous people like it just you get to work with them they're around it happens um and it's one of the really cool perks of the job but if i had booked something and i was like oh wow i get to do like I get to spend a day with billy zabka and ralph macchio like that would be cool but i got to spend a day with johnny and daniel and <laughs> yeah. like speak to them in character i mean it was just uh astounding it was amazing definitely, definitely. That's, that's what i mean yeah because you're right because you, you like you say you can you can be around them when you're when you're doing these various parts on things but you'll see yeah, your scenes are specifically with those two characters um, yeah so yeah i can just imagine the uh, <clears throat> the excitement as i say when you've grown up with it all your life and then you're there in the room with them with the two people who've like you know <laughs> forged that battle long 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 ago sadly too long yeah. and longer and longer isn't it because it's when you go on those little uh things where you have to put your dating on the internet and you have to <laughs> that's that's what's depressing <laughs> <Yeah>. me <laughs> you right? have to yeah. s- keep scrolling <laughs> keep scrolling yep. <laughs> yeah when they first came out it was just quick it was just like that now it's like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it's good it's good so i mean obviously you are an established actor as well matt and you've you've had many uh you know been on many things as well not just in film i was gonna say what drives you in and what are your motivations in this cutthroat industry that we that you're in because it is i mean you know for every time we see a decent a, a decent um role where you've got one on screen like that that i know there's a lot of work on in the background to actually manage to get that role uh, and yeah, so many sure. people who go for it as well so what, what motivates you what drives you um well to a certain extent being an actor is kind of the the family business for me my dad was a an actor mm-hmm. um and uh he's he's he, he's a, a jack of all trades i mean he's done it all he uh he's a playwright he's a director uh he's a professor he's an actor um and he ran a small uh theater program at a community college mm-hmm. in north carolina for almost 30 years and so when i was uh i think maybe 11 um he, that program it was just he was just starting out with it it had been around for maybe a year or two and um and he was developing it he ended up um what turned out to be just him teaching an intro to theater class and having a class put on a play because it was small and they could um over the next few years he had built a two years associate's degree program so people could get uh you know a two-year degree under him and then transfer on somewhere else and finish out with a bachelor's or a bfa in uh theater And so while he was running that program, he was a one-man band. He did everything. He taught all the classes. He directed the plays. He trained all the technicians. He built the set. He lit the set, painted it, taught everybody how to do everything, ran the box office, made the program, everything. (laughs) And so when I was coming up in middle school, there were a couple of times where um, the program was so small that he couldn't fill out the cast of a play just with students and so um the first time i I ever did a play it was a a really classic american comedy called the foreigner 
Mm -hmm. Um, and he needed to cast the role of Ellard and he didn't have anybody do it. And he he was already in it. There was nobody else to do it. He was like, Hey, I kind of need you to be in this play this summer. And I said, no, because that sounded horrifying. And then also like, I don't want to go to work with my dad all summer. I wanted to like skateboard with my friends and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but he finally talked me into it. And, uh, he actually, it's a funny story because he told me, a lie to trick me into being into the play because I kept saying no. And then finally he, he came back and said, well, look, and this was total BS, but he said, look, I already put your name in the program and they printed off thousands of programs. And if you don't do this play, then I will have wasted all that money and I might get fired. So you kind of have to do it. And I was like, ah, fine, whatever. And then of course, you know, once I started doing it, mm-hmm. it was, a, it was a blast and um, I got hooked. And so I went on to, yeah major in theater myself and uh i've just been doing it ever since um they always say that because you know to your point that acting such a cutthroat business and such a difficult world to navigate in so many different ways whether it's film and television or theater or whatever um if you can find something else to do that will bring you just as much joy then do that instead because it's going to be easier and it will break your heart less and you know so do that. And I, I never found that thing in my twenties. I tried to not be an actor for a while and, mm. um, and it didn't work. So here I am. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. I actually went down cause I, I was acting. I loved acting when I was younger. Mm. Um, I did a lot of theater, uh, school musicals. I was in the musicals was Drake, the Butler and Annie that we did. Um, nice. but yeah, I was steered down that path of be a bit more, you know, that, that like you just said, it goes back in, uh, especially back then, it was like, you want to be having a sensible career. You want one that, you know, because the actors are notoriously unemployed. That's what I, that's all I got told. And I got, I got steered yeah. by people away from drama and away from acting, which is what I truly loved. And it's the past few years doing this show, I've actually ended up being in a film as well. And, and oh, cool. so I'm starting it back up again because it's a passion that's never, it's a, it's a vocation. I think acting is rather, it's not, you know, I mean, I was saying it's a job before as well, but it's not, it's a vocation. It's a way of life is, is when you're in your acting. And like you say, with yourself, with your dad um, and, and the esteemed uh, <laughs> skills and talent that he has from what you're rolling off there, that is, it's no easy feat to do any of those, let alone do all of them together. It's right. just absolutely phenomenal. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a passion that you, it never goes away. And um and I think, yeah, I think if you haven't got your heart in it and you haven't, you know, then that's where, that's where you see people fall by the wayside is if you haven't, if they, they haven't got that passion to push on, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the issue, like you say, the heartache to go through. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I've done 20 years in IT. I can't say it's a job that I love. Actually, yes, according to my boss, who might be watching, I, I do love my job. There you go. Great. <laughs> the best. <clears throat> but, you know, yeah, but obviously for something that, you know, you want to live and that's what that's why this show started up is because I wanted to get involved again in, in at least some yeah, extent sure. to, to have that passion going. So, um, Well, and I think uh, being based in Atlanta is a really great, uh, really great place to be right now. I mean, of course, mm-hmm. with COVID, you know, the industry yeah. is sort of on pause, but the state of Georgia provides these really great tax incentives to productions to come shoot here. Um, The cost of living is is just generally cheaper than it is in LA or in New York. Um, But the other thing that we have going for us is um, studio space Mm -hmm. because all the studio space in New York, LA, Toronto, Chicago, London, it's full. Like you just can't find sound stages. They're all, taken off and if you can find them you've got to book them out way in advance and they're really expensive um here there's warehouses galore um so if you drive out uh atlanta is intersected by two interstates there's 75 85 that goes north and south and then interstate Mm -hmm. 20 goes east and west through atlanta if you go out i-20 uh for like 10 minutes in either direction you're in these like industrial uh areas they're just filled with uh, warehouses. Um, and so these production companies come in just like Cobra Kai. Production companies come in and rent those spaces out and turn them yeah. into sound stages. Uh, it's cheaper to shoot. It's cheaper to cast, to take, you know, all of your principal talent, 
uh, the director, the producers, all that stuff, your main crew members, it's cheaper to take all of those folks from LA, put them up here in Atlanta for six months or eight months yeah. or whatever to shoot a movie than it is just to shoot at home in LA. So because of that, yeah. So because of that, there's a ton of film and television work here currently and there's commercials, uh, but then also the theater scene is really great too. So a, a lot of us, um, uh, are, are able to, to work in both mediums. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that sort of, um, softens the, the, the blow a little bit in terms of work because I could audition for stranger things and not get it, but that's yeah. okay because I've got this play coming up in six months that I'm going to work on. Yeah, or if I yeah. audition for this play and I didn't get it, well, that's all right because you know, season two of raising Dion is coming back and I'll, hopefully I'll be back for that. So, you know, you just, there's, there's a, uh, you can keep more plates spinning that way. Yeah. There's more opportunity. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, I've heard that about Atlanta before. I've had several, um, uh, focal people point because of that, like exactly as you just explained it. So, I mean, you know, there's quite a few people who've based themselves now they've moved down to Atlanta because they've, they've yeah. find themselves, they're going to get more chance of getting a role in a, in a, in a decent series or anything like that, or, or any kind of work going is going to be in Atlanta rather than in LA. Just mm -hmm. to say, simply because of the costs, it's it's phenomenal. To be honest, I mean, I know that from London. When I lived in London, the costs of a of a place to live there, let alone a place to rent a yeah. huge warehouse space, it's ridiculous. There are a lot of independent well, actors as well. But they just they, you know, yeah. they move out to the country for it. Yeah, and then speaking to, you know, as I uh, continue to work here in Atlanta, when I'm speaking to uh, actors that are based in LA, like I remember, having, I had this exact same conversation. Mm -hmm with uh with uh sholo and and all of the um karate kid uh, or all the cobra kai kids yeah um that main cast we were just sort of sitting in the green room mary um uh, and you know we were talking about them living in la versus working here mm -hmm. and they said that and i've heard this from a lot of actors i had the same conversation with with uh natalia dyer a couple years ago um where you know she's based in LA, but she spends so much time out here that she's never home, hmm. and so it's almost like she didn't. As far as I know, she hasn't like purchased a house here or anything. But I, yeah. I remember talking to her. Um, we were shooting a movie a couple of years ago called uh, Yes God Yes, which is actually going to come out uh, next week mm -hmm. um, on video on demand on iTunes and all that okay. stuff. Um, and I play her dad. Uh, but I was talking to her about that, and she was like, "Yeah, I'm here for." three or four months or whatever it was shooting this. Then I get to go home for a couple of weeks. Then I'm back for stranger things. And you know, that takes, you know, six months or whatever, eight months. And then she's home for a little while. And then she was back here shooting another movie. Um, and uh, the cover Kai kids were telling me the same thing. They're just yeah. sort of always out here because there's so much stuff out here shooting right now. Wow, <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy, um, and that, I think that's the other part of an actor's job is when you are when you are filming away, because you are away for such a long time, and then you do you're only you're only home. It's a it's a it's a very very tough tough life. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, no, you're out. It's great. That's what Atlanta seems to be. Fair. I mean, I've spoke to loads. As I've got Erin Burns as well. She's lovely. It's quite loads of people who are based in Atlanta now and have little schools going. And I was going to say, part of you've been. I mean, it's not just Cobra Kai, like you said. There's uh, you've got lots of big franchises that you've been a part of you know sleepy hollow dynasty you know one of the biggest ones mm -hmm. in the you know um i think in sleepy hollow you're a, you you a mutual friend of ours dustin lewis as well i think he was in yeah sleepy yeah hollow yeah as well yeah 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 that's right yeah <laughs> yeah i was uh uh i was in an episode i was in the i got killed by a smoke monster in the in the cold <laughs> open so i got i got slaughtered before the opening credits but it was a fun <laughs> <laughs> it was a fun day. And I remember, uh, cause we were in a band and so I was there, I think for three days actually, mm -hmm. cause we had to get together as the band and learn the song. And then we had to record it and then we shot the scene and then they brought us back for another day, but none of us understood why, because we had already seemingly shot our footage Yeah, and, um, you know, we get killed in this garage. So they bring us back for this extra day and we get paid by the day. So it's like, you <laughs> yeah. bring me back. I don't, I, you know, I don't care. Uh, so we show up and we get the sides. And as it turns out, all it is is that since we've been murdered, 
the the detective that's trying to solve the crime or whatever shows up to the crime scene mm -hmm. and she's got this little scene to shoot but we're all on, on the floor under sheets like we're not in the shot yeah. they took like they took some crime scene photos and so those showed up so mm -hmm. i mean there was a purpose for us being there but yeah i just remember lying on this cold garage floor under a sheet for like 20 minutes i'm like <laughs> man this is this is easy money like i'm <laughs> very, very glad to be back for this <clears throat> <laughs> Yeah, sounds fair enough. The film I actually was in, I ended up being on the on cold, hard concrete floor as well, with my hands tied behind my back, um, and I had to because it was a that was a long twelve hour day because they are long days uh, sure. <laughs> for like f two minute scene. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, and at the end, I was I was having to lie with my hands tied behind my back because. Uh, Long story short, it was a nasty character which I didn't realise until I got there because they only gave me the little, they only gave me the part of the script where I was actually had my lines to speak. When I got yes. there, they turned around and they were like, "Are you sure you're okay with playing that kind of a character?" And I was like, "What? <laughs> what kind of character is he?" <laughs> I'm an office oh. manager. I'm an office manager, aren't I? And they went, "No," because he was actually a pedophile. And I was like, "Part of oh, a pedophile." Gotcha. Really? didn't have to do anything like that thankfully or any it was just sure. office speech but it, it was implied it was it was part of the implied part of it right but even so i was like really <laughs> okay <laughs> you might have yeah, told well, me that before i came <laughs> yeah i mean it's and it's interesting too because there are you know like the the character that i play on uh raising dion is not a, a good man he's mm. uh he's not really aware of it but he's super racist yeah um and there are times where uh uh, I've had auditions for, for things and I've looked at the material that I was given. Maybe it was the whole script. Maybe it wasn't, but um, there have been several times where I've just gone back to my agent and said, you know what? I don't even want to mm. audition for this. It just seems like whatever, you know, if this person is a racist or a rapist or a pedophile yeah. or whatever, uh, sometimes when the writing's not good, it just seems like that person is, maybe being celebrated or at least amplified, mm -hmm. but they're just sort of there for their own sake, as opposed to like the character that I play in Raising Dion. Yeah. He's a, he's a real bastard, but my character's behavior uh, generates the opportunity for this great scene with Dion and his mom, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, African American mom and an African American boy they get to have this, they have the talk about what it's like to be black in America and, yeah. and Dion's a really little kid. And so, um, you know, for me, you know, not being a person of color, I'm aware of those situations. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can talk to my kids about stuff like that from our perspective, but it's nowhere near the same thing as yeah. being able to be a fly on the wall and, and watch that conversation happen behind closed doors um, in, in a black family. So the fact that like my, my character helped, you know, sort of propel that part of the story, I didn't mind being a bad guy for that, but yeah, you know, some, sometimes I don't, <laughs> I don't want to be that, <laughs> that person. No, no, exactly. I get what you mean. I mean, the reason I was on the floor at the end was cause he was getting his comeuppance and the poor acid over the, um, <clears throat> over the, the the bits down below i'll just have it I'll politely oh, put it down nice. there wow. so yeah i had to like but it was two hours while they got the sh while they were getting the film the shot right so it was like like handcuffed on my back on a concrete floor oh, wow. going, i'm getting paid 20 dollars for the day for this because it was i just did it because i wanted to experience so yeah, I, was sure. like, yeah. I was like sure. i was like is this really worth it yes it is i love it <laughs> <laughs> Um, watching, you know, I was, well, I was busy watching the cameraman and the cinematographer setting the scenes and stuff because it was fantastic. Oh yeah, yeah, being on set is just super exciting. I, I it never, <laughs> never gets old. No, it's you say there's so many people buzzing around and doing their own little different things, and they're doing it so expertly. It's great to see and just yeah. see how it all comes together. Um, and I, and again, it's when when that does happen in a good way. That's when it's just show, like you say with Cobra Kai the way the writers have done it and everyone has come in, it's been brought in with such a respect that the show is just, it is just a hit. And obviously with season three going on Netflix now too. So I'm, I'm very vocal with my hands tonight. So yeah, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, going on season three on Netflix, that'll be, um, it's going to be, it's going to just gonna blow up even better. Uh, which will be I think so too. I mean, I, I, I love the show very much. And like I said, mm -hmm. even if I didn't have anything to do with it, it would still be one of my favorite shows ever. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but there are a, a lot of friends that I've talked to uh, over the years. They, they, you know, they'll come to me and still like this three years later or whatever, be like, mm-hmm. Oh man, I still need to watch your show. I'm like, well, okay, then, you know, go ahead. <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> How do I do that? I'm like, it's on YouTube premium. They're like, mm, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to sign up for another streamer thing. Maybe I'll just <laughs> wait. So the fact that, um, you know, it is, I, I saw uh, Ralph in an interview pretty recently and mm-hmm. he was asked about that. And he said that Cobra Kai moving from YouTube premium to uh, Netflix is kind of like moving from off Broadway to Broadway. Yeah. And I thought yeah. that was a pretty, uh, That's pretty a really great way to, to play it. Actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's just, it's, it's a, it's this underdog show in so many ways. Um, and so it's, it's going to be really exciting, I think for, uh, you know, a, for it to be exposed to a much uh, broader audience. And then also the fact that, um, you know, hopefully based on the success of season three, mm-hmm. knock on the wood, um, mm-hmm. that they'll be able to have, uh, you know, multiple seasons um, oh, beyond yeah. three uh, so that they can really tell the story that they've, um, you know, created. Uh, and you were, you were just talking about how, uh, about the, the company of Cobra Kai and, mm-hmm. and how, you know, that it's, it's successful because of the people that are in it. Yeah. And I just, I have to say this anytime that I get the chance that the, the big three, um, Josh Hayden and John and Ralph and Billy and all the Cobra Kai, I mean, everybody involved in that show, the Frank, the costume guy, like the choreo- the fight choreographers, everybody mm-hmm. is so cool and so sweet. <laughs> um, Ralph and Billy, I mean, there are other shows that I've done um, where, you know, they're super famous people in them and they yeah. sort of, they'll, they'll whisk in from wherever they've been hiding on set mm-hmm. and they'll do their thing. And then they go back to their big fancy trailer, which is somewhere like we can't even see. Um, and, you know, there, there are a lot of actors that are sort of on a, you know, a varying spectrum of that, you know, yeah. they're, they're working with you, but at the same time, like I'm in for two days this is their third year on the show mm-hmm. and they're kind, but you know, I'm in for two days. Yeah. Uh, and so I just sort of, you know, know my place. And sometimes, you know, us day players just know and understand that, um, you know, it, these famous people may not really want to hang out with you. Uh, even if they're forced to sit right next to you while we're waiting for the next shot, <laughs> Ralph and Billy are the exact opposite of that. Like those guys are around all the time. Um, they were never, they were just, they were part of the team. Mm -hmm. Um, and all the kids were really sweet. And, uh, and then the, 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 the big three, the producers, like they're so interactive with everyone and so interactive with the fans on social media. Like that's just, that's so exceptional and so awesome. I think that's one of, one of the things that's going to, um, help buoy, uh, Cobra Kai into like maximum success is just, I mean, they just, they're they're awesome people no it sounds fantastic they look like they have so much fun i was actually going to say there was one uh, when you're talking about the actors obviously some when they come on set there was one do you remember michael sheard played admiral ozzel in empire strikes back and played hitler in indiana jones and the last crusade yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. vaguely yeah. remember yeah i did a documentary with him year about 15 years ago when i was uh-huh. really an actor it was only, i was only I, I was literally i was a german stormtrooper stood like that in the end that was all my role was to be he came yeah. and, and i was told beforehand because i'm really excited because he was star wars actor and all that you know sure. and, and and exactly what you've just said that some will come on and people were saying he's a big famous actor he goes he won't even know you're there and it's like right okay and then i was stood in the hotel lobby checking in uh actually now i was getting a drink at the bar and i looked next to me and he was there and i was like oh. <laughs> you know starstruck he turned around he goes are you doing this documentary? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, let me buy you that drink. And he bought the drink. He drank us dry under the table for three nights in nice. a row while we were filming. He stayed with nice. us from like, you know, we filmed all day and then he stayed with us till like one or two o'clock every morning telling us stories of Star Wars. And I thought, you know, oh, that's fantastic. That's, that's a... <laughs> yeah, I got to do a, a, a episode of Ozark mm. and the, the scene was with Jason Bateman yeah. Um, but you know, of course he's like, he's a producer and I don't know if he, he didn't direct that episode, mm-hmm. but you know, as an executive producer and one of the, you know, the main creatives in the show, like he's got lots of 
plates that he has spinning and lots yeah. of things to do. So he didn't, you know, uh, he, he was very kind when he came in and shot with me, but he obviously had many other responsibilities mm. on set. Um, but I hung out with, uh, uh, Peter Mullen and Laura Lenny and a couple of the, other, a couple of the other actors in the show. And they were so, uh, sweet. Um, uh, and we were, because we were shooting inside a house, we were being held in like a small, um, guest bedroom mm-hmm. off to the side of the living room where we were shooting. It was this big house. And then, you know, the trailers aren't that far away and stuff. Yeah. So Laura Lenny could have very easily, while she was waiting for her stuff to be shot, she could have gone back to her fancy trailer somewhere yeah. and spent her time there, but she didn't. She squeezed into this guest room with the rest of us. And we all just hung out and talked about mm-hmm. movies and books. And uh, it was, you know, I think that's the, um, that's something that I uh, have learned and something that I will definitely uh, take with me as I move forward. Um, mm-hmm. uh, just to have like really good role models like like Ralph and Billy. Uh, I remember when we were shooting uh, the, the board scene in season one, um, we were on the dinner break. Yeah. And so I was I was sitting down with my three other board members. because mm-hmm. that's We had made fast mm-hmm. friends and that's kind of what you do. Yeah. Um, and we were all eating together. Ralph and Billy were around, all the kids were around and stuff, but John Hurwitz came over and sat with us and introduced himself again and then went down the table and told each of us, uh, how much he, they had all enjoyed our auditions for the roles that we booked, but then also other auditions that we had had. And he remembered all this stuff wow. and, and, you know, he spent a, a part of his dinner break talking to us, whereas most of the time, like I might know who the producer is, but mm-hmm. I can have a conversation with there are times where I haven't even, I haven't even met the director. Like yeah. somebody's just shouting at me from another room or the AD will come over and give me adjustments from the director. So the fact that they're like so hands on when we started shooting that day, they all lined up and came down the table and shook our hands and introduced wow. themselves to us. Like that, that doesn't happen. Like, hi, I'm Billy Zapka. Like, oh, hi, I'm Billy Zapka. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was nuts. They're, they're all just so cool. It's great. So I would have been, Johnny. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Sweep the leg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. I've, got, I've had some, a few questions or a couple of questions sent in. Emma, this was, I've left this one because it's about theatre because I normally ask about your theatre as well because I know you've got an extensive theatre background. Yeah. But, uh, Emma, she goes as Dorothy on Twitter, but her name is Emma. Um, she says, like, uh, she goes, how does it, f- well, no, that's, this isn't a theatre one, actually, that's another one. So, but um, anyway, Emma, <laughs> I'd like to know, how does it feel being part of the legacy? We've just been talking about this, of the Karate Kid legacy. But, um, she actually said, Ron's such a fan favourite, she hopes to see him back in season three, which obviously we all do. <laughs> so, yeah, in, in a summary, we've just spoken about it pretty much half an hour, <laughs> how cool it is. So. Sure. No, I mean, it's just, it's an incredible uh, honour mm-hmm. um, uh, to be uh, you know, part of the, the karate kid universe. Um, uh, it's not something that I ever would have imagined or expected. Um, but I'm, you know, just damn proud to be part of it. And, um, I, I hope the show is just as successful as it can be. And like I said, a couple of times already, like if, even if I didn't have anything to do with the show, like I would still adore it and be just as much of a nerd about it as I am. And just being in it is, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I'll just wake up in the morning and realize that and it makes me smile and giggle and it makes my day good. I'm just, it's, it's just so fun. And then also like the, the, the fans are so cool. Like I've never, um, you know, at ba- being based here in Atlanta and having had such a, you know, a, an extensive theater background for, mm-hmm. for decades here. Um, there are other actors that I know that have, you know, uh, become you know pretty famous in their own right um uh randy havens plays uh the the science teacher on stranger things Mm -hmm. i can't think of the guy's name right now um the character's name but randy's like a really good dude and he's like you know been around atlanta for decades and so watching guys like that or actors like that gals too um you know luck out into something like that uh, and then see like these, you know, these really interactive sort of like dragon con sci-fi fan bases that are, that are, um, so, you know, rabid, mm-hmm. 
and then you know me stumbling into Cobra Kai like it's just it's so it's so cool like I had an I my, my son came into my office today he was like dad what are you doing I was like well somebody asked for my autograph and so I'm signing these pictures and I'm gonna mail it off to him he was like wow you were famous enough that somebody wants your autograph like that's pretty cool and I was like I know that is pretty cool like so yeah it's just it's an honor and a privilege and and uh it's just so great fantastic fantastic one of the highlights of my professional life for sure excellent excellent <clears throat> excuse me um yeah no that, i mean you've obviously staged there as well you've with your stage background that you've got and obviously coming from that do you have a preference i mean this is a hard question because and i'll say it's hard not it's because the two mediums are so different in the performance there are 180 degrees in the performances that you give for screen or theater um so i, I appreciate that but is there a one that you prefer to do do you prefer being in front of the camera or, or or in front of a live audience i like i like working um and i like uh the the creative process um so that being said like yeah they are very very different I mean, the, the, the very essential fundamentals here and here are the same, yeah. but then everything that you're doing externally, it's insanely different. And then also the work process is insanely different. Uh, so I love, I love doing theater because it's hard as hell. Uh, and so it's exciting and there's a rush as you know, um, and there's just nothing like uh, you know, nailing that song or nailing that joke that you've been working on for, for weeks to get just right. And then, you know, on that, that, that perfect night, you crush it. The audience is laughing. It brings you joy. It brings them joy. We're in this, you know, communal human experience all together. Like there's, there's nothing like that, um, working on camera. Uh, but that being said, you know, working on camera uh, is fun and challenging in its own ways. It's liberating because you don't have to get it right just once. You can do it 50 different times or however many chances you get, and they can cut it together and, you know, figure it out. Um, and so, and then also like the, um, for just in a purely selfish way, like the, the recognition is, is mm -hmm. more for screen time because, um, you know, it can be seen over and over and over again, yeah. uh, over, you know, an infinite amount of, an infinite amount of time. So that's exciting too. And then also the, you know, the paychecks are a, a, a lot. Better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, um, I like doing both. Um, I think lately I've, my, my real joy is sort of gravitated more towards, uh, on camera work. Mm -hmm. Um, but I still, you know, I still do a play every other year. I used to, I used to do them maybe like three or four or five times a year yeah. um, when that was sort of my primary artistic outlet. But mm -hmm. over the last few years, just because the work's blown up here so much, I don't, I don't really have the time that I did because it's such, you know. It's yeah, a big, it's a very intensive and a very time consuming. Yeah, it's a big commitment. And then there are some theaters here that are uh, really great about giving us understudies. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody, you know, books a commercial or something and they're going to yeah. have to miss a performance or two, th th there's a few theaters here that will say, all right, great. We'll put your understudy in. Congratulations. Make that money. We'll see you when you get back. We got you covered. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a lot of other theaters that are the opposite of that. And so, uh, you know, to uh, sometimes it's just not fair to sign a contract with them that's going to last, yeah. you know, 10 weeks when I can, I can't guarantee I'm going to miss something, but I'm probably going to miss something, you know? Mm -hmm. And if, and so when in those initial contract negotiations, like that's always part of the conversation Yeah. whenever I'm having that conversation is like, Hey, by the way, like I'm recurring on at least two TV shows right now and there's other stuff down the pike. So I need an understudy. And if I book something and if I get called into work, like I've got kids, I got to go yeah, get that got, money yeah. and be in that thing. And you're going to miss me for a couple of days and then I'll be back and that's got to be okay. And some, well, you know, sometimes that answer is like, no, um, <laughs> no, <laughs> so, <laughs> you have to, you have to get it figured out. 
Yeah, no, totally understandable, totally understandable. I know what you mean about the buzz as well, because I, I say it was only amateur dramatics when I was in school, but even 30 years on, I can remember there was one line as Drake the Butler. I'd been watching the X-Files, and I'd been practicing this line as Mulder had, practiced, had done it on one of the, when he was being taken over by another person. Uh, and I just came up and I was like, Daddy Warbucks, it's the F. B I and I said it and the entire <laughs> audience just burst out laughing and they just, yeah. and they they all gave me obviously written in the paper as well the critic acclaim the disdain in the voice of the of Drake the butler when he was mentioning the FBI I was like yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> nothing years old, better I when you remember that yeah nothing better when you have an idea like that and then it you know it, it all just sort of comes to fruition Oh yeah, <laughs> excellent and Helen Helen Irvin has actually asked is following on from the theatre work. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, would you, which Broadway or West End show would you like love to be in? Oh, man. Um, that is a tough question. And I think it really, uh, hmm. there was a, there's a musical called Fun Home mm -hmm. um, uh, that I got to see on Broadway uh, when it was still running. Uh, I saw it at Circle in the Square, so they did it in you know in the round, yeah. Um, with the audience surrounding the mm -hmm. stage on all sides, and the the dad role in that show is uh, a really good role and really great for me. It was done, Fun Home was done here by a local theater a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. um, but with scheduling and stuff, I didn't I didn't even audition for it because I just um, wasn't available. But uh, but that that would be a great one. And speaking of Fun Home, when I saw Fun Home on Broadway. Um, the, it was a matinee, so it's supposed mm -hmm. to start at two 30, I think. And so quite often, even on Broadway, like they will hold the house for five or 10 minutes while everyone's still yeah. getting in, you know, and settling down and stuff. So they held the house for five and then it was like two forty, and then it was like two fifty, and we're all sort of looking around at each other. The, the show's in the round. So the audience, we can all mm -hmm. see each other and everyone you know seats are full like let's go <laughs> and we can see like these ushers walking around and people's walking talkies and stuff mm -hmm. and finally uh the actor that plays the dad michael severus came out and said hello everyone um sorry for the delay uh right around half hour which is actors are called half an hour before mm -hmm. curtain that's when they're required to be at the theater he said right around half hour uh the soundboard blew up oh. and so the band ran around the city and they got little practice amps and stuff. And so they've sort of, you know, amplified themselves and, and figured that out. And yeah. so they're going to play like that. Uh, but we're going to do the show without mics. And, uh, and so see you in a second. And so they did the show in the round, a musical with a live band with no microphone, <sighs> which meant that they had to like, you know, sing part of it like this, mm -hmm. but then also sort of cheat around like this. So we could yeah. over here, like get, get some voice. Um, and then on top of that, uh, the, the, in the premise of the show, there's a, a, a woman having memories about her childhood growing up mm -hmm. and there's three versions of Allison in the play. So there's little Allison, middle Allison, which is like college Allison and mm -hmm. the adult Allison is remembering this play and, and telling us about the past, about her youth. The middle Allison understudy was in, so no soundboard, no mics swing in for uh middle allison and when they finished and they did a great job but it was just so exciting because you could tell that it wasn't just like a a regular day at the office for any of them mm -hmm. um and uh d when they, they finished the play and after the curtain call they just piled on each other on the stage and were just hugging and laughing like they had just won the super bowl because they kind of had yeah. um the, the theater super bowl uh but yeah so fun house there's there's an answer excellent it's brilliant i love in the round i watched the crucible with john joe o'neill in the round oh nice and that was a very powerful obviously you know it's powerful play anyway but in the it was really good very very good yeah uh, i've always i'm too i'm too old now but i've always i always wanted to play bobby in a company as well <laughs> fair enough <laughs> excellent um Helen also asks, she's heard you're a teacher. She goes, is this true? Mm -hmm. uh, is it drama in the arts? And if so, are you planning on progressing to more hands-on behind the scenes in the future? 
play producer and director following the, your father's footsteps, I guess. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, I have, I've directed some plays. Mm -hmm. um, I am a professor. Uh, I'm an adjunct part-time theater professor uh, at Kennesaw State University, which is here in the Atlanta area. Um, and I've been teaching there since 2012, off and on. And that's kind of, it's my day job. Yeah. Um, I uh, got my master's in, in fine arts uh, at the University of Alabama, graduated from there in 2012. Mm -hmm. And so I've been able to teach on the university level since then. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I do uh, that. Um, and it does bring me joy. I mean, of course, it's also a job, um, but there are aspects of it that I really like. I like being able to work in my field and talk about, you know, my craft. Mm -hmm. I usually teach, I almost always teach, uh, it's, KSU calls it uh, theater in society, but it's like theater appreciation or intro to mm -hmm. theater. It's a, it's a humanities elective yeah. that um, students kind of have to take. Okay. They've got a few choices, but they like to take the theater because it's a little easier. If you're taking dance or music or art um those classes are harder because you have to memorize a ton of stuff like in the, the art class the final exam is just like here's 40 paintings you have to tell me like who did it when where why uh and so it's yeah and then in, yeah. Our, in the theater class in the theater class we're just making these short plays and that's our final exam yeah so um the class uh is pretty popular so it's also cool to be able to turn uh, people onto theater mm -hmm. uh, because it's it's an art form that um, uh, could always use more exposure, I guess, for lack of a better term. And there are a lot of people that think that they know what theater is like, or they or, or they've already decided that they don't like it. Yeah. Um, but their exposure to it has been so limited. I mean, if you saw like you know, your girlfriend or boyfriend and some horrible thing in high school and you didn't like that. And then your grandma dragged you to see, you know, Phantom of the Opera or whatever, and you didn't like that. And that's your only two experiences. Yeah. Then, you know, of course you don't like it. Uh, but if you find, you know, exposing these kids to, to a, a broader spectrum of theater so that they learn like, oh my God, like it doesn't really matter who I am and what, or what my sensibilities are. There's theater out there for me. There's a, you know, we live in a big city. So like, mm -hmm. you know, if you like, you know, dark, weird indie stuff, then there's theaters that do that. If you like big, brassy, polished musicals, then there's theaters that do that. And, <laughs> you know, classics and everything in between. So getting these kids to understand that is pretty cool. And there have been like a few times, more than a few times, but um, kids that just sort of stumbled into my class because they had to take a humanities elective have gone on to become theater majors and then graduated and gone on to awesome. like actually work in the field. There are kids that I've had in my classes that I now see at auditions for commercials and stuff. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so that's, yeah, it's like my, my little names on the resume. <laughs> or something. It's pretty cool. That is, that must be a really, really good feeling. And, and you're right. I think I had a really good drama teacher in mine and, and it's, it's a real, when you're in, to introduce you to there are you know he was very much like you in that respect that he wanted to introduce people to other aspects of theater because they've they've very very had very little um yeah yeah exposure to it i mean and i think my gcsc which oh god I, we haven't got an equivalent it's when you're 16 we sit gcses we did jerome cage rooms three men in a boat and we actually it was the first time it had been made into a play so no one had ever done it anywhere in the world and a theatre group were touring the UK and they were in mould and my drama teacher had gone to them and asked could we borrow the script to do it for a GCS for the, for the, for the exams he said yeah. oh, it won't go anywhere else and they said yeah sure so even before they'd had chance to perform it as a, as a premiere performance because I was there we were doing three men in a boat wow. by Jerome K. Jerome and we were sat here we actually were sat in the boat it was, oh, it was a funny play that one brilliant oh, that's amazing. <laughs> but that was that's the inspiration you know, that was the inspiration that's the feeling i got because that was the that was our teacher who'd inspired us to do that and i'm sure some i think some of them have gone on as well some of our friends have gone on and done other things too which is, is when you have that at an early age i think you know i, I applaud you for that it's brilliant to have that that's kind of an inspiration to follow <laughs> so, yeah. cool. Um, the last question I've got from before I go on to my signature one, uh, I know we've gone on mm -hmm. for quite a while, I've rambled away. So uh, this one's actually from someone who I've, I've never really heard of. Is Susan Gallagher? 
<laughs> oh yeah, I know her. <laughs> hey Susan, she's thrown this question in. She was like very excited that you're coming on. Um, so she goes, "Are you attending any comic cons?" Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd love to. Uh, I, it's you know one of those things. I hope that you know as Cobra Kai's audience um, explodes, like it probably will. You know, mm -hmm. once it drops on Netflix, um, that you know maybe. There will be situations where you know people will reach out to me or us, Susan, and you know the rest of the gang, and and uh, call us in. The only so yeah, totally not opposed to that. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun. Um, we did. There's another uh, podcast uh, called Cobra Kai Companion. Yep. And it's based uh, out of based out west uh, in the upper northwest, um, but. Uh, Peter, the guy that runs it, uh, had I, we text and stuff, and he was like, "Hey, man, I'm coming to Atlanta for Dragon Con." Like he had gone to Vegas and won some money, <laughs> uh, you know, not a ton, but enough yeah. to like cover the trip. And so he was nice. like, he talked to his wife, and he was like, "Hey, I think I want to go to Dragon Con if that's okay." And somehow he convinced her to let him spend this <laughs> money to take the trip. But the cool thing was that, and of course, uh, there's there's a ton of local Atlanta talent that's yeah. in um, Cobra Kai, yeah. uh, but none of us were asked to be on any panels or anything like that. Mm. Um, uh, certainly not myself or any of the other committee members. But what yeah. Peter did from Cobra Kai Companion is that he set up a meet and greet for fans, like at Dragon Con. It wasn't oh, actually yeah, part yeah. of the con, but there was a bar right there. Yeah. And he figured it all out. And uh, he and Brianna and a couple other people that are really involved in their mm -hmm. network there at Cobra Kai Companion set this thing up and a bunch of the local actors showed up. But there were all these, because it was Dragon Con, there were all these fans there from all over the world. So I met like, you know, they didn't come specifically just to meet me. They were there for Dragon Con, but, yeah, you know, but fans, still... from, they were from England and from Australia. Um, and they had brought stuff for us to sign. <laughs> um, and it was just like, it was, it was a, it was a pretty neat experience. And there are, uh, through that experience, there are Cobra Kai fans that I have made friends with online. Yeah. Um, and you know, we're, we're in Facebook groups and follow each other on Twitter and all that stuff. But like people that I've been talking to for over a year, like meeting some of them face to face was mm. like, that was really neat. Oh, I can imagine. So yes, Susan, I would love to do that. <laughs> Brilliant. And Cobra Kai Companion is a great show. It's to be fair to me, it's, 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 I have listened to oh, it. So. super fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Excellent. And I'll bring you on to my final question now. Now, this is a Good. signature question. And I had a chap called Mike Quinn on my show a few years back who has been a Muppeteer with Jim Henson for 35 years, must be now. And he's been wow. to Star Wars and things like that. And someone sent this question to him. And I thought, you know what? That is such a brilliant personality question i'm going to try and ask everybody i speak to so if you could have a muppet created after your own character of your own personality what muppet would it be and it could be a mix it could be it could be just one of what that's already made it could be a mix of a couple or it could be a brand new muppet wow i don't know what this muppet would look like <laughs> but i think personality wise i think i'm some sort of mixture like sometimes I'm Bert, sometimes I'm Ernie. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ever smart enough. I don't know if I'm ever wise or calm enough to be a Kermit. Uh, but I think I'm definitely, when I'm at my best, as kind as Big Bird. So a mixture of those guys. That's, kind of, that's one abomination of a mix if you mix it up. <laughs> I don't know what that would look like. I'm no puppeteer. I'm just an actor. Yeah. Uh, you know. Fair enough. Cool. Is that bird? Bird? <laughs> I actually sang. I did a Kermit the Frog. I do a Kermit. Well, it's not a very good one, but this is how I started my show. I did a Kermit the Frog impression, and I sang it. I did the, I did the little song to this chap, and he was like, okay. I was like, thanks. You've just... <laughs> I did, you know, the rainbow song, why they go, why are there so many songs about rain? That's my Kermit. <laughs> That's great. 
En dan hebben je je verd maar jood. Do or do not. <laughs> Bad impressions. That's that's what that's what got my stroke started. <laughs> Cool. Anyway, Matt, is there anything you would like to say to people who are listening or watching as a final parting comment before I stop recording? Uh, I think, uh, you know, just if you've made it this far, then bless your heart and, and thanks for listening. Um, and I just, I know that uh, as, as, you know, far as this quarantine thing that all of us are dealing with right now, um, you know, and, and a lot of other things that all of us are dealing with right now, especially here in the U.S., um, that it's it's really easy sometimes to get uh depressed or anxious uh or angry um or you know sad uh frustrated and i think uh you know i think the more the more that we keep in mind that all of those reactions are are natural and that they're okay uh and the more that we can cut each other slack um as we get through this together uh, the better. Um, but we're not going to be able to get through it and it's not going to get over with until everybody starts wearing masks. Um, and that's just the a fundamental truth. Um, so mask up and wash your hands. And if we all do that, then this, uh, virus dies away. Um, but believe in the scientists and the doctors and, uh, you know, cross-referenced, uh, researched scientific material and, uh, you know, as opposed to like something you saw on YouTube that is not true. Uh, so everybody just hang in there and stay healthy and listen to the experts and, uh, and we'll all get through this together.